Hi everyone and welcome to News Take. I'm Rebecca Frank, VP of Research and Insights at the News Media Alliance. And today I wanna to talk about the future, specifically the future of the publishing and journalism industry. Now, we all know predictions are impossible to make and that this industry has evolved and continues to evolve at an incredible pace over the past years and decades. And so I think as we try to talk about what's coming, what might be coming, we're super fortunate to have our sister organization, the American Press Institute, acting as our scout on the frontier of technology and audience behavior and helping news organizations learn how to implement and adapt successfully for a sustainable future. Uh, I'm so excited to have with me today two dynamic leaders who are really helping shape the future of our industry, Sam Ragland and Eli Trong. Sam is API's Vice President of Journalism Programs, leading API's efforts to promote cultural transformation and business sustainability in media, helping news organizations serve diverse readers and communities more effectively. She also leads API's Journalism Programs portfolio, which we're gonna ask a lot of questions about. And Eli is the VP of Product Strategy at API, managing the existing American Press Institute product portfolio, working to strengthen and expand the current products while also serving as a product coach and thought leader for the news industry. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, first of all, I, I wanna hear from both of you how you got here. So, so what were you doing before you joined the API team? Um, we'll start, let's start with Sam. Well, uh, I joined API about six months ago, and so I still feel like an API baby. Uh, and prior to joining the institute, I was at another institute, institute the uh, Pointer Institute, actually, where I was a leadership faculty member there. Um, I was the director of the um, flagship Women's Leadership Academy program, of which I am a 2016 grad, a light is OG 2015 grad. Uh, and that's actually where we met um, when she was the guest faculty in my program in 2016. Um, and prior to teaching leadership, right, like kind of stepping outside of uh, the newsroom to become an educator of journalists and news people. I was in the newsroom. I was running a digital team for Gannett Gatehouse Florida Group, which is about 22 uh, daily newspapers. We had centralized digital content strategy um, for that effort. And so I was running a small team. We were working, auditing content, creating revenue strategies for all of our Florida papers. And then Prior to that, my first newspaper gig was actually on the digital side of a legacy shop uh, at the Palm Beach Post, which is still my hometown paper um, that I love. And, uh, you know, I mean, I still have lunch with my bosses there like once a month. <laughs> so I'm still very, very much connected to my home newsroom. Awesome. What about you, Eli? Like? Tell us your story. Sure. Uh, well, yeah, as, as Sam alluded to before, this is this is the first time that we're overlapping professionally. but. Um, like working together at the same place, and it's you'll you'll hear probably strategically um, the things that we bring to the table really dovetail together. And it's I think I'm extremely fortunate to work with Sam here officially um, as as a partner in crime for this all of this. Mm -hmm. um, so I came from about a decade of national newsrooms um, and digital media primarily. Um, so I most recently was the director of strategic initiatives at the Washington Post. So um, not too far from API's office now, just down the road. Um, and so I spent about four years there um, doing a lot of interesting bridge work in product management and um, overseeing a team of five called the Lead Lab. So we were there to create um, innovative storytelling projects and really experiment with emerging technologies and figuring out how can we use them to push our storytelling forward, our reporting processes? Can AI and ML reduce harm for video production software um, as our reporters are on the ground reconstructing forensic you know, recreations of really traumatic news events, for instance? Um, what can emerging technologies offer journalists? So I did that for about four years. And um, on the other side of that job, I really also tried to figure out how to monetize and fund those really big, high lift, expensive projects. So that's really where my comfort zone is and where I'd like to push at API and where I have been so far, which is sitting at the intersection of product innovation, revenue, and service to journalism. Um, but before that, I started as a restaurant reporter uh, <laughs> in journalism. I got into digital production as it was in the early 2010s. Um, which led me right down the road to product management and trying to have a seat at the table of um, what what do our communities need? How do we make those things sustainable? That's great. Well, 
I, I think we'll dive right in. Let's talk about sort of how API is working on the challenges, what challenges you're most excited, you know, to be facing, you know, Eli, you talked about paying for innovation. That seems like a, a great place to start. Yeah. So this is, this is interesting and something that I've worked with, um, actually News Media Alliance the last several months that this is the first time I've had um, working with, um, you know, folks who are able to change, have, create systemic change uh, beyond what publishers and folks working as journalists can do. I think it's really fortunate that we get to learn from each other and figure out how to change the ecosystem, which is, you know, currently, um, this has been an undercurrent and an issue for at least eight years of my career as I've worked with tech platforms. There's always been a platform problem in digital journalism, right? Um, in order to distribute to communities, wherever they are, um, you as a newsroom and news organization have to put your content on all of the platforms or as many as possible. Um, those platforms don't pay the value of our news content and they built digital monopolies sometimes, um, mm -hmm. huge, huge empires um, from the page views engagement and reach that our content provides. Um, so alongside the work that NMA is doing mm -hmm. um, and in the context of Meta and Twitter, especially in the last uh, six months to a year, um, divesting funds and deprioritizing journalism where before there were lots of experiments and collaborations with yeah. journalism organizations, um, especially my team on the product strategy team at API, um, we're excited to train news leaders to figure out how do you pivot? How do you figure out what the landscape looks like for reaching the right people that you're supposed to be reaching? Um, how do you prioritize carefully with the platforms that you do choose to use? Um, maybe you don't need to use all of them. Maybe you don't need to reach like young audiences full stop like on this shiny platform that is not monetizable and you really do need the revenue right now. There are other ways potentially to do that without giving all your content away. Um, how do you choose those platforms to use to distribute and see deeper engagement there with their local communities? So some examples that we've seen recently with um, a series that we've been putting on called Tech Talks, where we've been navigating how do you transition to Google Analytics 4, which is in July, and um, what does social media independence look like? Um, so it might be Facebook for video content only, LinkedIn for business content, sort of splitting up and strategizing what you can do with with the platforms that are available to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems like that's a, another opportunity for you too to overlap because there's also that journalistic element, right? You you have a responsibility to meet people where they are and understanding where they are and what they need and what, what they want. Um, yeah, Sam, are, are you, you know, what challenges are, are you sort of facing down and you know, maybe with a smile more than a grimace. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know what? I get a lot of joy in the work, right? Like Alight and I can kind of like crack jokes about the multitude of problems, right? But like, <laughs> we love news and if we didn't, we wouldn't still be here, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so being able to work alongside my, um, Michael, Alight and others at the Institute is a real honor and a real privilege. And there's a lot of energy right now, like happening at API, right? Like, what is it almost 50 percent or near over 50 percent soon enough of the staff will be brand new under michael right which is wow. very very exciting it means that this legacy shop that has like a lot of like industry cred um is operating more like a startup which is very very exciting and we're all kind of rallying around industry-wide problems uh specific to platform and specific to people right and yeah. so while uh, light is thinking about platform first and then how we're reaching externally the community talking with our managers on how they can get buy-in for these products the program side is thinking also about platform but even more so about the people that need to be able to to really kind of move some of these initiatives forward um and what does that look like right like i think one of the biggest problems that we're facing is just like that sustainability has only ever been talked about in regards to the business. But if we don't have people to sustain the business, then what's the point in having business sustainability, right? And like right now, being a journalist is kind of a drag. Uh, it's exhausting. It is not where you go if you are looking to be, um, you know, a parent in the future, right? Like it's just like not a super healthy industry. Um, and so I'm really, really interested in how I think the natural inclination of journalists to be curious and disarming to their communities and to the people that they talk with, how those skills can really be turned internally into the news organization um, across the people who are making the work 
happen? Can we be more curious leaders? Can we be more empathetic, right? Can we be more caring? And that's seen as a, as a benefit as opposed to a weakness. And so I think for me, the problem is holistically, how can we look at sustainability across API um, and across the industry so that as a whole, right, there is longevity in this work and in the people doing the work as opposed to not having that as opposed to having deep levels of, of turnover, lack of retention is a huge yeah. problem right now. Um, and, it, you know, we've got to kind of tackle it from a multitude of angles. I love that. Those are those are two um, interesting uh, systemic challenges. And, and there is a relationship to them, right? I mean, I think, Sam, you said it so well. We talk about business sustainability, but we also need to create organizations that sustain the people doing the work. Oh, yeah. um, I just, I, I love that so much. I'll be thinking about that. Um, I want to ask about two recent API projects. Um, it's the beginning of 2023 and the, the recent, the inclusion report and index and the project in Pittsburgh. Um, can you just give a high level overview of those projects to our audience that may not be familiar with so they can get interested and, and dive in more? Yeah, the uh, the inclusion index is being led by Dr. Latrell Crittenden, who is just a brilliant journalist uh, and academic who has decided to kind of live at the intersection of those worlds. And he's tackling um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion belonging issues in our newsrooms mm -hmm. and in the communities that those newsrooms serve, really with like a level of academic rigor that I don't believe that we have seen across the industry. It is... Um, it is deep white glove work, no doubt. Uh, and it's like totally necessary, right? And so what the index does is it basically looks at DEIB across a series, like a, a, across a series of parameters and gives newsrooms a score based on research, um, interviews with past and present staff, community members, data, um, things to alight in her team and their source matters tool. And all of that research kind of culminates into training and action planning um, for these newsrooms to then kind of stand in front of their communities and say, here are the ways that we've wronged you. Here are the ways that we plan to move forward to reconcile this. And here's here's what we need to do. And here's some of the things that we need we need help with, right? And, and what we have found in Pittsburgh, uh, two things. One, the community wants, they, wants to be represented in their local news um, outlets. Um, they feel completely left out, um, and yet they are also forgiving in a way, right? They're like, hmm. thank you, God, for like finally seeing me, and like, let's talk about how this has gone wrong, right? On the other side of that, what we learned in Pittsburgh that I think is one of the most fascinating takeaways is that if one news organization messes up in anything related to any fringe or marginalized community, the entire ecosystem is, is to blame for that community. Mm -hmm. And so it's not, I'm the print paper, like I'm the newspaper and we got it right. And I'm the TV station and we got it wrong. The community is like, oh no, nah. y'all are all media and so y'all are all wrong, right? And so this, is, this is a huge takeaway for the industry, especially at the local news level, where there is still kind of like some infighting and some competition, sure. right? Like you cannot compete when it comes to being an inclusive and belonging organization and how you represent your community. You are all either doing the work or you're all being blamed for not doing it. That's, that's fascinating, right? We've talked, again, it, it all comes together about what news people want and the information and the distinctions that we see on the back end, you know, these historic distinctions, it's not, they're not being made for the audience. The audience is, is taking things in. Um, Eli, Sam mentioned the, the Source Matters product, which I think is, is such a fascinating product. And I'd, I'd love to sort of hear where that fits in and, and sort of your thoughts on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's there's so much to learn also from the work in Pittsburgh that Latrell is doing. He's a fantastic colleague. I think my team is really, really excited to continue working with him mm -hmm. um, and the inclusion index in the year coming forward or the, you know, the coming years. Um, so both of the products that we have right now, so Metrics for News and Source Matters are um, have the same product philosophy, and that's partly why I was so interested in coming to work for American Press Institute. Um, they're strategic tools to help any news leader positively reinforce sort of 
audience and data informed behavior um, in a way that it's difficult to do and encourage culture change otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's difficult to be accountable for internal change in general uh, for news leaders. You can tell your reporters all day long, um, please track your sources, please reach out to um, fewer official sources um, like uh, you know government officials and people who have press offices so it's very easy to hear back from them on deadline. But can you talk to more people in the community perhaps who this issue faces? Um, it's as a former reporter who grew up in Chicago, it is much easier to talk to the press offices of the government um, you know, than it is to talk to community members. I know that. This tool shows you all the work that your newsroom has put in and shows you recommendations of like, hey, this isn't cutting it. You know, here's the changes that we've seen. Um, it doesn't give you any sort of like, hey, this is, you know, a recommendation in general. It just gives you the data in front of you. You've talked to um, X percent of the last month or something, 75 percent of, uh, of people who just aren't in your community. They mm -hmm. don't reflect the people who you're supposed to be writing for or creating videos for or uh, creating, you know, news content for. So um, all that stuff is, is easy to miss as a reporter in the daily grind of things, but it's surely noticed by your communities, as Sam mentioned before, and it's purposefully excluding potential communities that you could reach and that would sustain your business years into the future, right? So you, your newsroom continues to be relevant. So Source Matters is really interesting in this way. Uh, we are piloting a cohort of 13 newsrooms this year, um, led by Katie Kutzko, who is the education manager on my team. She's really wonderful. And um, and yeah, it's, it's very exciting to kind of see them go through a year of, um, these are a lot of different newsrooms who we haven't worked with before. Mm -hmm. um, when we uh, originally built the product a couple of years ago, so two or three years ago at that point, um, we originally worked with a lot of legacy newsrooms um, that were going through digital transformation. It was a little easier to set up with them because they had a lot more daily content that we could analyze. Many of the newsrooms in this cohort are experimentation so we can see what does it look like to work with um, more of a weekly publication. Mm -hmm. So they don't have as much content, but they will over time want to make sure that they're reaching the right community. Um, even, you know, being a publisher of color doesn't mean that you effectively engage with the community that you're trying to reach. You are yeah. representing like in a certain way, but you need data to be able to back that up. So everything that we're going to be doing with Inclusion Index, with the programs team, is really to bolster um, that community listening with actual data and being able to track that long term through tools like Source Matters. I find that I find that so interesting because, you know, I wanted to talk to you both about sort of cultural transformation in media organizations. You know, you talked about it's not just a question of intent, right? If the editor, if the leadership is saying, we want to do this, we want to do this, but you're not gathering the data, you're not structured to gather or analyze or use that information. What, what are some bright spots um, beyond just the tools and sort of adoption of these this transformative thinking from a you know from a culture whether that's changing the culture bringing in new people bringing in new ideas i mean do you have any any good stories about sort of organizations who've who've made some of these trans transitions well you know i mean i think one of the things that we're seeing is like audience engagement is different than community engagement it's the thing that Alight and i keep talking about it's why api's tools are so interesting um, that they're moving along with the transformation that's necessary for the newsrooms to not just like sustain themselves, right? Like to continue to get the same old money you've always gotten, um, but it's so that these newsrooms can actually thrive in the communities that they were meant to serve and that that organizations are interested in, in having that data is a real bright spot. And we're seeing it across, across the Institute. We're also, you know, we're noticing things like, um, like for, you know, API runs the table stakes, pro one of the table stakes programs. And because of the pandemic, we pivoted our programming from year long programming to sprints, four to five month sprints. Mm -hmm. And there have been organizations who have participated in like nearly all of the sprints, right? Like the, the Keen Sentinel, which is so amazing. Um, they are like all drinking the Kool-Aid of transformation <laughs> and they love it and they live it and they breathe it. They live on their toes, which is something that I used to talk about 
really all the time when I was doing leadership training, right? Like as a newsroom leader, you will either be flat footed and unable to pivot quickly toward both the needs within your newsroom and the needs external to that newsroom, or you will live on your toes, on the balls of your feet, which makes it a lot easier for you to pivot. When that ideology permeates an entire shop, it becomes very easy to move, right? Because everybody is basically casting pebbles into the same lake. All of those pebbles ripple and the ripples connect. And so you're seeing the transformation spread, which is very exciting, right? Because cultural transformation is hard to make it stick. I am of movement, right? A light is a movement in and of herself. Um, and if we don't do it right, then the movement stops when we leave where we are. Mm -hmm. And so cultural transformation only happens when people individually decide to commit and you almost, you hit like a, like a critical mass of yeah. those agents of change across one organization. We're starting to see that more. And of course, it's still very, it's hard, it's hard work. Sure. Yeah, I, um, I also think too, you know, you talked about individual people, but the more projects that you're doing, right? Moving to sprints, you might have different people from the team and then everybody's you got it. You know, you I was going to say in, infected, but that's that's not a great word. Everybody's inspired. Oh, yeah, not, pandemic. Inspired, not yeah. <laughs> inspired, not infected. Um, but with the same, with this different ethos. And then, as you say, right, the the ripples interlock. Um, exactly. And and Eli, do you want to talk about? You know, you, you mentioned source matters, but do you want to talk about metrics for news and where that fits in as well to to really, you know, creating or or. Um, fueling this this cultural change and transformation? I think what's really missing, um, if you're in a really small shop, um, you could use another I, another 10 people at least. But what what's really seems to be missing and a lot of questions that come in are really strategic questions mm -hmm. that are really not our place to answer. We want to create this tool that doesn't tell you what to do. It only reflects the goals that you put in the data that you decide to put in and reflect that back at you as a news leader. From there, it's up to you to decide what to do with that data. Are you going to try to in increase, you know, um, uh, going to try to meet your goals or are you okay with looking at that data over time knowing that it's, you know, like um, maybe it's not the time to push folks or maybe it's, it's really difficult to do this or that. Um, so the success of the tool is really up to each newsletter who uses it. Um, it tries to empower managers of any level of experience. Um, here's what you need to do and do with that what you will. A lot of, uh, a lot of follow up comes with um, sharing use cases of like, hey, here's what another manager in a similar sized news organization who it's also um, another startup or another similar sized organization as yours. Here's what they decided to do. You don't need to do the same thing. Your community is different. Um, local news is not a monolith, right? It's very, very different depending on what market you're in and the people that you serve. Um, but here are some use cases that you can, um, by working with us, we can try to share so you can develop that strategy a little bit more formally. Um, use it to understand your subscribers in the future. Um, I, I think it just tries to help you continue to reinforce a culture of changing. That's really, really difficult to do all the time. People don't like changing. You, uh, these journalists have sometimes had very, very long careers um, mm. and have succeeded doing the thing that they've always done. Um, and the number one goal is production day in and day out. But we do, I think the most successful news leaders, national or local um, or international, really understand that you need to make space for a lot more than just production if you want to see your organization in the future, right? And being able to serve people who find you relevant, who trust you, um, all of that is incredibly important. And so we're excited to continue to build tools like Metrics for News, Source Matters, and build on that and integrate that a little bit more into our programming that Sam is leading. Um, so it's easier for news leaders to take advantage of these these things altogether. Yeah, yeah it's it's interesting. You know, you mentioned sort of people who've had long careers, but I, I wonder too if given the evolution that's happened around people doing the work, it's, it's you know, are you finding that there, they're, I don't want to say there's resistance, but that you are, have to educate people who have been doing this for a long time, or are the people who've been doing this a long time maybe more 
akin and ready to adapt. And it's people who haven't done it as much who are like, well, I've had success with this, you know, in a shorter time. So I'm going to hold on to that. So where do you see the resistance? Oh, man. You know, Rebecca, we, we try to lead the willing first. And it's I think it's it's not worth the effort to try to um, to try to change a lot of minds who are completely like, I don't need data. I, mm-hmm. I, I operate on whatever else it is. And that's completely fine. Um, but the willing to me looks like, um, you know, uh, leaders who understand the need to continue to learn and try to learn about their communities. Communities have changed a lot during the pandemic. People have moved around quite a lot. Um, one of our uh, one of the newsrooms we work with quite a bit um, and one of our part time contractors, Allison Shirk, she's comes from a newsroom, um, several newsrooms, but one in particular, Chattanooga Free Press, which has seen lots of influx from folks from different areas in Chattanooga. Um, it changed who Chattanooga Free Press is serving. That's that's true across the country. Um, so it's not an and it's it's not like the work is ever done once you understand yeah. these concepts. It's more about how do you apply this um, going forward. Mm-hmm. So I think the um, you know I, and you don't need to become an expert in anything particular. We're here for best practices. We're here to tell you like you're these folks are doing such a great job. Um, here's what to learn about maybe your community a bit more. And we want to encourage folks who are um, who understand that. If you want to get anything out of um, working with other folks and learning all these lessons and spending this time in different cohorts, um, you have to put some work in, right? And to be able to see some rewards, which is not revolutionary, but it's something that um, I'm I'm learning every day. Also, trying to understand. I I just came from a huge, incredibly stressful newsroom. I understand it's difficult to to try to make space for all the different things when you're responsible for so so much. But I think there's always a little bit of room to look at. What can I let go of so I can invite more modern strategy in or um, think about the long term once in a while? Yeah. yeah. You you also said one other thing that really stuck with me. You talked about how, you know, metrics for news is a tool that you put in the goals, right? I think in in my career working with data, working with people, talking to them about data and research and information, you know, I'm always saying the the only strategy that works is a strategy that helps you accomplish what you set out to do, right? It's only a good strategy if it helps you accomplish something. And it's only a good tool if it's actually optimized for your goal. I think a lot of people um, assume that tools are neutral, right? In the way that they're set up. And and as you well know, right? There is no such thing as a neutral tool. Every tool has has an objective in mind, um, or many of them do um, in particular, Anything that's free, right? Uh, you are the, you're it, the product. You're the yeah. You're they're the getting product. the data from you. If it's made by Google, even if it's you know data driven, right? Right. Google Analytics is designed to help companies do things that help Google. Otherwise, they wouldn't give it away. And I think just positioning products that are that are about the journalistic goals, about the news goals, that are flexible that require that understanding of your audience i think is is such a powerful powerful thing it's it's a strategic competitive advantage like to be able to really reach this audience well um when i worked with advertisers and clients at the washington post that was the number one thing they were looking for Um, what sets you apart from other national news outlets right and so as a local news publisher, you do need that. You need that differentiator. You need that differentiator from other outlets in your same city. You need it to be very vastly different if you're like a, a broadcast TV station than a newspaper or the new digital startups that are popping up. Um, it also, it helps reinforce things like um, local news publishers may not want to chase growth in that way, right? Like um, I every election you see is just like tons and tons of um You'll see in Google's like first couple of pages for election results, you'll see local news publishers right there along with Washington Post, Politico, New York Times, Wall Street Journal chasing the national elections, which is why that's like an antiquated strategy. And then you put a ton of people on that kind of stuff in hopes that you'll be able to chase page views. But is that actually what makes you different? Or can anyone click on any of the larger, uh, more highly ranked pages from national news outlets or something like that? So really it helps you try to reinforce like, um, for instance, if you're trying to go for more subscribers from a certain demographic or um, more deeper community engagement, it will help you track those things and just take all the data sources that you're using like Google Analytics or Adobe or Mather and be able to, um, to not 
necessarily just reward growth, which is like what they're they're made for, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but more complex, more nuanced analytics of just like, did the change that you implemented in your politics section last, um, you know, like uh, last month or so, is that actually driving deeper engagement? You can see that month to month. And with the election fund that we did last year from American oh, yeah. Press Institute, where we asked newsrooms to um, to listen to their communities and do an experiment in which they engage with them a little bit more, um, they were able to track those things. So it's it's really exciting to kind of see over time, how can we influence um, editorial strategy in local newsrooms to better serve those communities? And you can see that in your bottom line very, very quickly. Yeah. yeah, right. I mean, the thing about local news is you don't have to compete with national and you probably won't be able to. I think that acceptance of, uh, of the things that you can't do as well as someone else and Sam, as a, as a leadership trainer, you have to tell me how I'm doing. If, if I was going to say, you know, getting to that acceptance of right of of where your limits are or where your audience's limits are or your audience's understanding. Or desire to understand. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you are anticipating that, I mean, if you want your newsroom to grow uh, and if you want your people to be healthy and if you want them to use tools like what Elida is talking about, tools that center narrative, right? Like it's different than chasing page views. These tools are centering the narrative of your growth and opportunity. Mm -hmm. So it's it's using stories to communicate to storytellers, essentially, if you do it right. Like if you explain the tool right, if you bring the tool into the newsroom right. And the leaders who do that are leaders who are highly self-aware. And you cannot, uh, you cannot help kind of lead others and help them accept change as quickly as they can, because we're all different, unless you have kind of sat with yourself and decided who who am I? Uh, how do I handle change? And how does that help me help other people um, to handle change? And so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're right. I think that um, you have to know who you are. And if you are a news leader listening to this podcast or watching this video, who is still thinking, so specifically about the bottom line, which you believe only happens through the output of your of your workers, then you're actually doing leadership wrong, right? Like focusing specifically on the work is not creating a sustainable organization that is going to uphold and thrive within the community that you were built for. Focusing on the workers, however, will get that done for you, right? But it's like you've got to kind of step back and give yourself like manage your own expectations of exactly what it is that you're looking for. I think that's so interesting. And and on that, you know, I think that we've all seen over the the time of the great digital transformation of the industry, right? The introduction and the disappearance of so many different kinds of tools, just that uh, that ability to say, you know, we tried a product, we tried a strategy, we and it didn't work you know, cutting and and realizing when things haven't been successful, you know, getting comfortable with that idea. Um, you know, you mentioned sprints, right? And the nice thing about a sprint is if it doesn't work, you've not invested months and months and, you know, thousands of meetings and many dollars, right, in terms that could be deployed elsewhere. Exactly. And I think that that, uh, that comfort is something that, uh, you know, is, is, is difficult to get to, you know, you mentioned self-awareness, mm. you know, the awareness, even just of starting a project to accept that it might, might not work out. Uh, that's, uh, that's always very tricky. And, uh, and something that, uh, you know, potentially the news industry has, um, you know, it feels both, well, this is an industry where there's been so much change, and there is, you know, so much difficulty, sort of almost like a what have you got left to lose mindset. But then at the same time, it feels fraught, right? Everything feels feels scarier because of the importance of this work. How do you balance, um, you know, rolling out new ideas for things like elections, right? Things that feel like we are, they're so urgent and, and, and so clearly important. How do you, how do you allow for experimentation? Well, you have to consider what you're actually rewarding, right? Um, and if you do an experiment and then you quietly let it die away because it failed and you tell no one, 
then what you're actually communicating is that experimentation is not welcome in this space because if it is and it doesn't work out, then I'm not looked at again. Nobody really knows about it. It's just kind of like that thing that's like a secret that gets hidden away versus like if you experiment and fail and fail very loudly, if you celebrate the failure, which you should because how much can be learned in failure so much, right? right? Um, but is your newsroom actually set up to celebrate these things? And are you as the leader kind of mirroring the mirroring these things out to your newsroom, right? Like, you know, I talk about my my former manager at the Palm Beach Post all the time, and I literally just had lunch with him last week. And he was one of the best managers I've ever had. Um, and he was always on me about my work-life balance. Um, I noticed that he uh, would leave like every day at six o'clock, uh, which was amazing, right? And then the question was like, well, Sam, did you leave every day at six o'clock? Absolutely not. I was like staying late. I had terrible boundaries, you know? Um, and then I thought about it and somebody mentioned to me like, managers should always leave loudly, right? Like he left, but he kind of just like grabbed his bag and like snuck out because he had to have dinner and then he was on email like all night, right? Um, and I do wonder like, would I have like been more willing to leave and would the newsroom would have felt more comfortable to exit when they needed to if the top dogs in the shop were like, I'm going home for the day, right? Like my out of office is set, right? Like if you're celebrating that and really making a show out of this behavior from a genuine, from a genuine place, I find that it is a lot quicker to mirror that behavior as somebody who maybe does not have the level of power, right? Mm -hmm. That other people do. And so you've got to really think about what is it that I want my newsroom to value? What kind of newsroom or news organization am I trying to run? And how is my behavior actually standing up to the things that I'm saying I want to see? Because what is likely happening is you're displaying a behavior that actually negates uh, the newsroom or the news organization that you think that you're leading. It's it's so interesting, right? Because the the models that we have for industries who have accepted failure, right? It's it's tech, right? It's it's fail fast, break things, that sort of thing. But it's not particularly a model for an industry that is uh, work life uh, negotiation, where the where it comes out on the side of life. So that's really interesting. If, if news, which, you know, there will always be breaking news, right? There will always be a need to do this work, um, you know, even the olden days to stop the presses and to, to change things, um, you know, the, to tell that story, what we know when we know it. But this idea that if, if there are opportunities to make this industry more one where we say we do experiment and fail and do a lot of different things, but we also understand people and what they need, right. um, that'd be really really powerful and compelling. I'm going to be thinking about that as I loudly leave every room I ever go into. <laughs> I'm leaving I, for the day. Sam, I'm definitely doing that too. Um, you know, I, so I, I ran, I purposely ran a research and development team where we had to experiment um, in, in our newsroom. And the thing is, it was, it was so shocking to collaborate with folks who are just like, you know, I haven't had the chance to experiment or try anything new. Um, we had the benefit of being able to pick our choice of like, 1100 folks in the newsroom at the post, but this was the same from wherever I went to um, when I worked in innovation in my job was to come up with something shiny and new, but it was actually useful for the newsroom and like could be funded for longer. Like that was, that was the flip side of my work. Um, and I was always shocked to encounter people who saw, um, you know, if your job is innovation or that your job is change, um, then that's the, those are the only people who are allowed to experiment. But mm -hmm. I think as news leaders, incorporating that in the culture is going to, as I keep repeating, really vital to the future of, um, you know, the newsroom that you create today that are, will be there 10, 20, 100 newsroom to the future, which used to be easy to imagine or easier to imagine for folks who came from legacy newsrooms. But mm -hmm. it's just, it's really interesting to see um, how to set up a culture like that. I think to encourage people to give you their best ideas, you have to be able to tap into what Sam is saying, have, uh, have people be trustworthy, be worthy of those ideas of people's best ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second guideline there that I, I tried to set, not always succeeding at the, the post because there was so much emphasis on development and not always like the room to research, but as much as possible, creating constraints in which people can be creative of like, mm -hmm. hey, our goal is this. It's not everyone's personal like 
um, agenda or like your very favorite thing or like this this topic that might have been over covered actually that we think is undercovered. You know, like here are some constraints and here's the goal in which we're all trying to reach. How can we increase, um, you know, like how can we make climate coverage more relevant to more people because it intersects with everything? How do we um, incorporate data a little bit more in, um, you know, analysis and the columns? How can we add a, a more voicey angle from someone who is um, who sees data in everyday situations and can answer those questions from audiences? Um, how do you include the community a bit more in your reporting in a way that's really interesting and fascinating? So I think being able to set some guidelines in which um, you want to hear ideas all the time and then deciding to pilot something every once in a while and investing the necessary resources to make that happen and not just do something with nothing, you know, like yeah. set, set, set experiments up for success. You can just, you can do one a year if you want. Like it doesn't have to be all the time. It doesn't have to be everything. It doesn't have to be everyone's ideas, but I think you would gain a lot of trust. I think I've accelerated very quickly in my career from earning that trust from people with different skill sets. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to say like, let's, let's try it. Let's try it now. Let's see what we learned. The lessons are as important as the output and being able to share that as its own, um, as its own lesson externally of like, we've failed at this, but look at what we came up with instead. This is really interesting. This is what we learned yeah. about AI and news. This is what we learned about 3D modeling and telling a news story in that way. It's, it's, it's not the right storytelling method for X, Y, and Z. It's just as valuable. Yeah, it's so important to light exactly what you're saying because there's so much risk, right, that's associated with it and our newsrooms are so depleted. And so um, we need to be able to accept failure and we need to be able to accept that things don't always work out. Uh, and we also need to set, like we need to communicate and probably over communicate that your value in this news organization is not dependent upon if this project or innovation or idea like succeeds or fails, right? Because a lot of people at this point, they would have a ton to contribute, but they're like, I'm not going to volunteer. And then what if this doesn't work? Because nobody knows how the layoffs are happening and some organization, I mean, more or some are better than others, right? And they're just like, I don't even want to take the risk of putting myself on the block when really what you're asking for is just like the you know, the cognitive diversity that people in your shop are bringing to a problem, right? And you really want to like promote that because you need lots of people thinking about a problem and 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 then kind of like understanding the guardrails that Alight mentioned and then flaring within that, right? And then I would say a last step, and I don't even know how we got on this, but if you aren't like <laughs> communicating that the idea came from person X, right? then you're also missing an opportunity to reflect back into the shop that this is who we are. And we're right. piloting because so-and-so suggested it. I know that it was a random, it was a random question at the end of that like quarterly all staff, but it stuck and we started to build around it. Right. And, it, you know, because if people see that somebody else's idea took off, right. Um, then they're going to be more willing to continue to share or to even start sharing their ideas. Yeah. That's great. All right. Can I so add one last note to that. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> if, if you have any control over this or not, and I, I, I can't, I want to acknowledge my privilege as, um, as someone who was not likely to be laid off because of that role, um, but also wasn't set up for success all the time. Even though my job was purposely to experiment, I wasn't always encouraged to take the time it needed or get the resources that I needed to do that. Um, one way that I sort of future proof that job or that sort of role is to productize failure. So being able to use every component of the things that didn't work out in the way that you wanted to mm -hmm. um, when you're experimenting and you don't know what the output looks like. I think that is um, if you write about it, if you um, contribute some sort of like um, some sort of behind the scenes thing, uh, you mm -hmm. write to your community of like, hey, we tried out this way of reporting. Uh, we showed up. We're trying to listen to community members. We didn't really get that um, that many different kinds of places, but like different opinions. Um, where else should we go? I think Honolulu Silver Beat has like, I think that's an example like it's brought up a lot. They have these pop-up newsrooms that they went to different libraries across the different islands. I mean, they could just continue like narrowly covering what they see um, in Oahu, but they, they do a lot of fantastic work of just like, there's a lot of different kinds of people in Hawaii, especially over the pandemic as well. There's a lot of conflict and tension. Also with a lot of newcomers to Hawaii, there's not any else any else, any other places where you can go, but like yeah. this island, and that can be true of other places too. Um, 
what do they want to know more about? You know, so it's it's really trying to figure out how to use all the different parts. It's like nose to tail eating kind of thing. Yeah, it's, it's nose to tail failure. Yeah, there you go. And it's um, I always called it something different in my corporate speak. I always said, you know, we succeed in a different way than we expected. Here's here's what we got, you know. So that was that always got um, some laughs from folks, but also they yeah. were like, that's actually right. That's the kind of culture that we want to be able to instill as well. Like your job is to try things. All of our jobs is to try something new and evolve this beat that you're on or, um, you know, making some room for how could I cover this differently? And so that we can actually reach a new audience or deeper and deeply engage with the ones that we have. That's really, really powerful. So for you both, if you if I handed you the magic wand, which I don't have, but you could wave it to solve one major issue um, and then, you know, nothing happens in a vacuum. There would still be bands and other things. But what would the one thing be that you say, like, if we could just solve this, we could get on to the next set of challenges? Sam, I would love to hear your response to this. <laughs> I do have a response to this. I mean, I think a lot about it, right? I think a lot about why I left the newsroom, why that was a very difficult decision, especially leaving what was easily the most healthy team I've ever been on, right? Um, and so I think about it a lot. And I just, I think a lot about the absolute necessity for local news in our communities and just how deeply unhealthy the newsrooms are and how that that is a, that's a, 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 a tension point when you when you want to get the stories of the communities that you're representing and yet you bring into those stories a level of anxiety um, and unrest just because of the industry at large and kind of the you know uh, the unhealthiness and that it per perpetuates and so I guess if I were to have what is this wand? Is this like the men in black? <laughs> yeah, whatever. Or something. Yes. Or um, Harry Potter is for, is yeah. for me. Or Harry Potter <laughs> or any other. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about this kind of like low key movement toward care uh, and how care operates differently than empathy and compassion, I think. Um, and, and so I'm thinking a lot about the, the idea of a thick skinned journalist and how that actually doesn't serve um the longevity and the sustainability and the health yeah. of the newsroom and so if i could wave a wand i think i would kind of wave it at those kind of thinkers and doers right who who aim to like leave their mark um and be welcomed uh to be like full humans at work which is 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 for some of us incredibly dangerous to be our authentic selves at work um and yet uh, it would contribute so profoundly, I think, to the way that we cover community and to the way that community sees themselves and the journalists that are reporting on them. Um, and so if if journalism could one day be seen as like an industry that cares, that would be so radical. Um, I mean, that would be, I think, worth celebration. And I would, I, I mean, whatever. I mean, I'm here at API. We're working on it. No, well, that's, <laughs> That's sort of my point, right? Like that the industry could then do all the other stuff. Right. right. What about you, Eli? Anything? You, you ready to build that? You ready to build that? Oh, carry wand? That's a very good one. All right. So, um, all right. So let me think about it. I have my Harry Potter wand. Um, okay. And I've been talking a lot about product. Um, I'm on the board of News Product uh, uh, Alliance, which is a really, really fantastic organization also that helps uh, formalize the discipline of product and news. I think it's going to follow um, what I'm going to wave my wand at will follow that that sort of discipline. I think it is really something to to try to figure out which product people have always tried to evangelize, which is prioritize ruthlessly so you have only the good stuff that reaches um, the people you're trying to reach. Um, I think right now, and it always has been rewarded, like the number and the quantity of um, stories, the, the output that your porters have. Um, it burns everyone out. Like um, I see a lot of people leaving the newsroom in every sort of kind of different role um, because that's what we still reward over time, which is the quantity of your output. It's what keeps you to the office um, until seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, or 
overnights into the mornings and things like that, because you can't humanly produce at that level and have it be sustainable. Um, I think what product folks know, or at least try to keep in mind, is you have a finite like team of people. Um, you have a finite amount of human power and skills in which to accomplish something. And for some reason, when I was like, um, I was strictly on the news side, I was like a food reporter. I didn't know about that. I just, I had to cover everything all at once. Um, it was like a, a heinous version of that amazing Michelle Yeoh movie. Like a very, very heinous one where I was just like the same in every multiverse of just like running myself down into the ground, trying to cover all the interesting things. Uh, but trying to really instill in news leaders that, um, again, can you envision your newsroom 10, 20, 100 years in the future? How do you get interesting people with different viewpoints in that newsroom over time? Um, when your staff retires or they move on to different things, um, what is reasonable? I think something Sam and I listen, think about all the time is what is reasonable retention wise? What can you, um, as a manager, invest in all of your people's career development? It is okay for them to cycle out and chase different things in the ecosystem. If there is a healthy news ecosystem, they should be going on to different things and growing if that's what they want to do. Um, so what are the things today as a news leader that you can do to set your newsroom up to evolve and thrive in that future with what you're doing today? Um, and really, I mean, that's that's the number one thing is prioritizing. It doesn't even have to be anything else of just like, we are going to prioritize our people over everything else. Here's what we're going to invest in you. And here's how we're going to ask you to uh, prioritize in the things that you want to cover, because all of that stuff is not only just coming from the top. It's also you know, internally, people as journalists really want to achieve great, great things and can be quite hard on themselves. So trying to reinforce positively, we need to change, we need to make conditions more humane and um, fun, frankly, like uh, as a journalist, um, to, to work and be curious and not burnt out all the time. How can we sustain that? How can we encourage that at API? I love that. So my last question for the two of you, um, so that next time, if we do this again in a year or whatnot, what are you what are you watching and thinking about? What are you what are you not even sure how it's gonna play out, what it's gonna look like? What do you what do you wanna what do you wanna talk about in six months, twelve months, eighteen months? The thing is like things don't things change a lot in six months or eighteen months, mm -hmm. and they also don't change that much. Right. So I think the thing the, the thing that's challenging about that is Sam and I work on very, very long term change, which is difficult. How do you encourage cultural change? Yeah. And that's something that we're interested in digging into in lots of different ways. Um, trying to figure out what we can learn from organizational change um, as, a, as a discipline, like an academic discipline already that we can be able yeah. to pull from. What are other industries doing that are able to, to incorporate healthy cultural change? What's working? What's not working? Um, I think the extremely humane conditions that some big tech has been able to do is not sustainable because ultimately you remember that it's not about the workers. It was more about like building this gigantic monolith of something. Yeah. Um, so what actually does work? I think I'd be interested in talking about case studies of incremental change um, mm -hmm. that I'm seeing in local newsrooms across the country and around the world of um, what's what's working in tiny, tiny ways every single day. Yeah, that's what it is, right? Because it's the it's the tiny daily behaviors. It's the responses to the conflict. It's the response to somebody showing up late. It's the you know, it's the way that your body like <laughs> like naturally move because somebody says something sideways in the editorial meet. All of these daily responses um, culminate into your culture, right? And if we at the American Press Institute aim to um, support and develop and sustain yeah. uh, healthy news organizations, that is our goal, then how are we contributing to the conversation by even giving these news organizations a North Star, right? Like, what is a healthy news organization? Can <laughs> we tell you first, right? And that's one of the things, It's what. so personally, what am I watching, right? Because I love the work so much, but I'm thinking a lot about that framework and how mm -hmm. it can be created, founded in evidence, data, empathy interviews, and et cetera, so that what we're able to share and hold both ourselves as an institute to account and organizations in the industry at large to this framework that helps them navigate, right, the ebbs and flows of life uh, and the difficulties um, of the work, right? Like journalism is hard work. Journalism is traumatic work. There are lots of things kind of happening there, but we're trying to get 
healthy. Yeah. We need to define that first. I love that. Um, I, I couldn't think of a better place place to end. I, I I hope you can figure it out. I think if anyone can, it is the two of you <laughs> and the incredible team at API. Um, I want to thank you both, Eli Trong, Sam Raglan, for speaking with me today. I'll I have be thinking about this conversation for a long time. Um, for our, our viewers and our listeners, you can learn more about API at AmericanPressInstitute.org. You can always reach me, Rebecca, at NewsMediaAlliance.org. And please, uh, if you can, share the podcast with a friend, with a colleague. Uh, you can find us on all the major podcast apps, YouTube, and our website, NewsMediaAlliance.org. Uh, thank you again for listening to News Take, and I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.